Good evening, everybody, and a warm welcome this evening. My name is Tim Wagemakers, and I will be your host during this program, The People's Game, as part of the Festival Forum on European Culture. This year, the festival theme is We the People, and together with guest speakers and our audience, we explore whether or not a European people exist, and if so, who are they? We explore this theme in exhibitions, debates, film, theater, and interviews. European artists and thinkers and their rich imagination take the center stage. I want to welcome everybody present here live at the Bali and also a very warm welcome to everyone watching the live streams across Europe and beyond. Um, tonight, we'll be taking a journey through the people's game, the game of football, to discover its role in our daily lives as Europeans. It's one of our favorite things to watch as a people, and we can, and we can always fall back on players' names when our foreign language fails us. What role does this global sport play for our identity? We will discuss football's highs and lows and whether football can create ties between Europeans or whether it drives wedges. And we'll talk about this with sport journalists David Goldblatt and Simon Cooper, with Eniola Aluko, who is sporting director of Aston Villa's women's team. Rocky Hayakaya unfortunately had to cancel recently because she is in Sudan promoting Sudanese women's football with her foundation Favela Streets, which I thought would, was a perfect reason, uh, but unfortunately she could, could not be here. Um, and nevertheless, we have plenty to dive into tonight. Unfortunately, I also have an esteemed guest with me in the studio, Laura Youngson. Give her a warm round of applause. <laughs> Welcome, Laura. Hey. Let me just give a short introduction. Uh, you are a serial entrepreneur. You are also a two-time world record holder. You co-founded Equal Playing Field, a not-for-profit working to reduce gender inequalities. Um, your group's first world record was the highest altitude football match played in 2017 at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. And then you were not finished because you also set a record for the lowest altitude football match at the Dead Sea in Jordan. Um, and you also had two records during the Women's World Cup in France in 2019, the most players in a five-a-side game and the most nationalities in a football game. Um, so actually, I've never sat at a table with someone with so many world records as you. But aside from that, from your world record habit, I could say maybe, uh, you run Ida Sports, which is the world, world's first female boot company, uh, making football boots specifically for female athletes. And you can be found on the pitch on a Tuesday, a night playing very committed amateur football in Amsterdam. Totally, yeah. That was the whole package, right? That's it. Yeah. Um, before we dive into your work, tonight we're looking for the link between football and culture and identity also. During the corona crisis, well, we had to refrain from football from a few months, playing and watching. What did that do with you as a football fan and player? So actually, I, it's a good job. Actually, you haven't got a ball here because there's no way I can uh, live up to Rocky's amazing street football skills. But I spent my lockdown actually trying to practice keepy uppies. So whilst you can't get on the pitch, actually, it's a time when you can work on your own skills. And I think one of the cool things about um, the experience during lockdown is how everyone moved on online. And so actually, we saw a lot on socials of um, women giving tutorials for yeah. other girls and like l teaching each other skills. So you've got this kind of, um, it wasn't filtered anymore. You could just go directly to the players and start to learn yourself. But still quite happy to be able to play again. You play footy, right? So, yeah, so happy to be back on the pitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We are at a cultural festival. Um, why were you keen? Well, besides the fact that we invited you um, <laughs> to, <laughs> to come and talk here about the connection between football and culture. I think for me, Football has been such an amazing way because I've li had really great opportunities to live around the world and football and language for me are so intricately intermingled. Um, when I was playing at university, we had an Erasmus student from Germany actually come over and um, in, she was a great player. And unfortunately, in the second match of the season, she dislocated her shoulder. And so as the only player on the team who spoke any German, my t I was tasked with taking this player to hospital and um, translating because we're in the northeast of England. Mm -hmm. So even that's tough to understand the accents uh, as, a, as a British person. And so to take this player to hospital and interpret for her in another language. And, but we had united through that love of football and you have then a friendship cemented um, even more so because of the sport. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. But again, I then, I mean, I've had an opportunity to play in Brazil and learning football words on the pitch and here coming to live in Amsterdam, um, muy bom, lecker, lecker goal. Like you start to pick up the language because you're on the pitch and you're there. So it's really, I think it's a common way for people to connect. Yeah. Uh, even when you don't know how to talk, you can still talk the language of football. Because you've came to live in the Amsterdam in, in Amsterdam in January, yeah. and then you started playing footy, and that was actually your entrance, maybe also in Dutch culture. That's it. So you get to learn learn the culture through the discussions that people have at training. Even when I ask the coach to slow down, it doesn't happen. So I've had Dutch immersion lessons through football. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but you're also on a mission because you're working on reducing gender inequalities in all sports, and you chose football as your battleground, maybe to organize actions and we have a small clip because we, as I said you were playing on, on Mount Kilimanjaro and we have a small clip of how that went. We started climbing at around 1,500 meters and then when we played a practice match we reached about 4,200 meters which actually would have taken the title for the highest altitude match at that point. And then we carried on climbing into the crater and played the final match at 5,714 meters. <laughs> Running is pretty tough at the top of the mountain. <laughs> waiting for your breath to catch up with what your mind thinks it can do. The Kilimanjaro trip, in its essence, it's a mission to do something to inspire other people to change the status quo. Yeah, I think that last sentence maybe says it. You, you, you chose football to address a societal issue, actually. Totally. So I think, I mean, part of the reason for me setting out on this crazy mission, having this idea was I got frustrated with a lot of the smaller inequalities that we experienced and it, that manifested it through sports. So the pay inequality, I mean, it's a joke how much professional female players get paid, although it is changing. Um, even things like getting hand-me-down kit or you're not allowed to use the training pitch because mm. maybe, I don't know, like women's tiny feet will mess up the pitch yeah. or something because we have, you know, harder stomps. I don't know. So all of these kind of frustrations, which you also see manifest in society, they were coming out through football. And for me, it was a question of, can we do something that would show yeah. that we can do anything and, and kind of change the conversation around a lot of these kind of, oh, well, you can't do that. You're, you're kind of, you're female, you're second class athletes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You played nil-nil, right? On the Mount Kilimanjaro, no goal. After all that. After all that work, no nil, goal. Nil-nil. Yeah, but you had invited two amazing goalkeepers. Yeah, so we had, one of the keepers was this former Swedish keeper, and so she actually saved yeah. some incredible yeah. shots on goal. So yeah, well, we might have to do it again. <laughs> You also said that we, we need to change things in football and you, you, you took matters in your own hands. You, you, you have a company, Ida Sports, and you also, well, you can show it, it are your boots, but it's the first female boot, actually. Yeah, so part of the trip on Kilimanjaro, for me, I've always had to wear kids' boots and hated it. Um, and then I got to chat to all these players that have been to the Olympics, been to the World Cup, and it turns out that they were all wearing men's and kids' boots as well. Realized that actually women's and men's feet are different. Um, and the bigger brands really aren't making yeah. uh, products for women. So set out and have created, created a football boot that now exists yeah. and, and yeah. is worn by female players, so yeah. This one, right? Yeah, and, and, and the heel is a bit is smaller, for example. Yeah, so there, there are differences between men's and women's yeah, feet. Of course. Um, women's feet tend to have narrow heels. We have a different shape at the front in the toe box, yeah. we call it need more support around the midfoot and so yeah, yeah. we made these changes and produce a boot that's now being worn yeah. by players in different leagues yeah it, it, it it's it's only a boot but at the same time it says something about maybe how easy it can also be to change things you see around you because it's about opportunity and trying to create something and tonight um, i'm really happy you're going to be my co-host and 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 
and, and having your say, asking questions to whoever you want. Um, what are you curious about tonight? I'm really interested to, um, I got a chance to preview some of what David's going to be talking yeah. about. And I think looking at the way um, football mirrors society and some of the, the themes that he's talking about, we're also fascinated by the way footballers perhaps don't class themselves as politicians, but we're really starting to see a sports activism. Mm. Um, and maybe there should be more, maybe there should be less. That's something we can debate, but it's yeah. super interesting to see that um, passion for change and, and unfiltered responses, again, through social media, it's really had a, an impact on how footballers are able to talk directly to yeah, fans. Yeah, yeah. And you're also a great fan of Aston Villa, so that's also... Yeah, so I'm very excited that we've got Enio Luca on the yeah, show. Yeah. Let's start with the programme then. Um, I said you have a rather free role, but we need to set the frame of the night a bit more. What are we going to talk about? And who can do that better than David Goldblatt? He's a sports sociologist and author of books such as Game of Our Lives, but also The Age of Football, The Global Game in the 21st Century. We'll speak to him live on Zoom. But Stefano and Jonathan of the online platform Football Makes History paid David a visit in Bristol where they recorded his keynote speech for tonight. So let's listen to that. I'm David Goldblatt and I'm speaking to you today about the relationship between Europe, football and identity. Robert Schuman, the French foreign minister and one of the architects of the European Economic Community said back in the 1950s, before being a military alliance or an economic entity, Europe must be a cultural community in the most elevated sense of the term. But what kind of culture would make sense for the whole European continent? The founders of the European Union were lawyers and diplomats who saw the rule of law, liberal democracy, the expansion of technology, economic growth and economic networks as the basis of Europe. And that's all very well, but that's not the basis of, you know, how you feel about something. <laughs> Obviously, the realm of language, of symbols, of collective activity is where one must search for a European identity. But Europe has a problem. Um, literature and cinema, which might normally form the basis of a shared identity or sense of cultural space, are irredeemably divided by language. <laughs> Popular music, which at least is, you know, uh, non-verbal, um, remains trapped in national traditions all over Europe. In the 1980s, the European Union created its 12-star flag, introduced Ode to Joy as its de facto anthem, created the Erasmus educational networks, and even suggested that Europe might compete in sport as a way of generating a sense of Europeanness. While Erasmus has worked very well and the flag is well known, in sport it's only in uh, the Ryder Cup in golf where we are actually Europeans. And that's fine for the transatlantic business class who love the game. But for much of the continent, it makes no sense at all. Maybe football would have been a better option. Back in the 1950s, at the very moment that the European Union was being created and the European project was being launched, so too in football. French journalists and administrators called for the creation of a European football organisation, UEFA, which till then did not exist. and invented the notion of the European Cup, a pan-European club tournament that today is the Champions League. And in so doing, within a very few years, and with the great luck of having the amazing Real Madrid win the first five European Cups, a shared collective space 
for Europe-wide narratives and Europe-wide images was created. Half a century later, one could make a very strong case for saying that European football is the one thing that displays the very best of this continent more explicitly, more clearly, and in a more popular fashion than anything else. Consider, football in Europe is way more inclusive and expansive than any other cultural phenomena. Football since the mid-1950s has traversed the East-West divide. You can now see games played between nations or clubs from Iceland to Azerbaijan. Russia and Turkey, often considered beyond or peripheral to the European project in the world of football, are very much within the continent. UEFA uh, and uh, the leading football associations in Europe offer, and of course the bar is very low, probably the best governance in the global game. They are relatively uncorrupt, they are relatively democratic, and they provide a clear framework within which multiple actors in multi multiple nations can prosper. <laughs> European football is an incredible economic success. It's now the industry is something of the order of $30 billion a year. It's bigger than the European publishing industry. It's bigger than the European cinema industry. At the very pinnacle of the European game, I am convinced that the football being played is without question without question, the best, the fastest, the most technically accomplished and tactically sophisticated football that we've ever seen. And it has lost nothing of its drama and its storytelling capacity in the process. It's an extraordinary export success. You know, the European Championships are the third most viewed sports tournament in the world after the World Cup uh, and the Olympic Games. And as for European league football in the top leagues, these are now truly global phenomena. Somewhere between 300 and 400 million Africans tune in to the English Premier League. 400 million Africans, not to mention the extraordinary audiences around the world for both uh, the EPL, La Liga, etc. There are many reasons for this success. But one of the most important, I think, is that European football reflects the same structures of dynamism, culture and education that have powered the best of the European economy. We have a combination of uh, competition and collaboration between the many cities and the many regions of Europe. Um, you have the capacity to learn quickly, to move quickly, to mingle quickly. And on top of that, European football has invested in technology, science, training and education in a way that no other football culture has done. Medical science in European football is in a different league to everybody else's. The use of data is far advanced. The caliber and the quality and the sophistication of the training facilities at the main football clubs and the main football nations in Europe is without parallel. Culturally too, we can tell a very st positive story about Europe, particularly in the 21st century. Traditionally associated with bellicose nationalism and to an extent violence and social disorder, the early part of the 21st century saw European football at its most carnivalesque, at its most peaceful. Anyone who was at Euro 2004 in Portugal um, would have found it the most extraordinary trans-European sun-soaked beer festival of football. Peaceful, at times hysterically funny, incredibly diverse and mixed. Along the way, football has provided um, an instrument, a rallying point for new kinds of more benign nationalism in Europe. Germans at the 2006 World Cup fell back in love with their own flag. Um, the Spanish 
um, found in the team that won the World Cup. A rare point where Catalans and the rest of the country could come together underneath the Spanish flag. And in Belgium, the multicultural team that has been so successful in the last few years has provided a way of seeing and understanding Belgium beyond the traditional Walloon Flanders divide. We also have an incredible expansion of women's football, indicating the progress of gender rights and gender equality in Europe. We have the creation of the first really serious anti-racism movement in football that has been going now for 10 or 15 years. And even on environmental questions, European football sometimes reflects the very best of us. Euro 2020, now postponed to be played next year, was criticised for the amount of air travel it would create as uh, 12 stadiums around uh, Europe would generate so much air travel. But UEFA, uniquely in global sport, has committed to pay the offset costs of all of the carbon emissions. An extraordinary development which should of course be the norm for all commercial sport in the future. There are reasons for scepticism. Another decade since uh, Euro 2004, 15, 16 years now, we have had an extraordinary economic crash and we have had 10 years of extraordinary political and cultural turbulence in Europe. And one could simultaneously argue that European football has come to reflect and display some of the very worst of Europe. Um, in the economic realm, the last decade has seen increasing inequalities, as indeed there have been in the whole of European society between the big countries, the medium countries, and the small countries, between the big leagues and the small leagues, between the professional game and the amateur game, between the very big, biggest clubs that are global brands and everybody else. The gap under conditions of globalization and without forms of social and economic regulation is producing greater and greater levels of inequality. There is also um, the uh, transformation of the football spectacle itself which is increasingly controlled by commercial forces and indeed by government forces. Over the last 10, 15 years, you know, more than half a dozen governments have produced very restrictive surveillance um, and control powers over what goes on in football stadiums and goes on amongst football fans. <laughs> Look a little though beneath the surface of the European economy. Look in its grey areas, look in its dark shadows, and you will find, as with the European economy and indeed European society as a whole, there are deep, structural, entrenched problems. First and foremost, corruption is extraordinarily widespread in football associations, in clubs, bribery, embezzlement, tax evasion that goes right across the game from the highest to the lowest levels. We have widespread people trafficking in European football, particularly of young African men coming on the hope of playing in European football to the continent and being abandoned on the streets. Money laundering is rife in the game, from the Russian Mafia's involvement with small Portuguese clubs to what's going on in Italian football and again across the continent. We have rule bending, we have organised criminality everywhere you look in the game. Football has always been political in Europe. Statesmen, states, political parties, trade unions have always tried to grab their little share of the glory. But I would argue that in the last decade or so, we have had a scale of political colonisation of the sport that is simply unparalleled. We have had a takeover of this cultural, collectively owned realm by private political forces for their own purposes.
most egregiously under President Erdogan. Turkish football has been entirely colonised by politics and placed at the service of Erdogan and his party. In Hungary, Viktor Orban has made making Hungarian football great again at the centre of his anti-migrant and racist populist politics. And in both cases, large amounts of state money has been funnelled into the game um, to support construction firms who are essentially supporters of these regimes. Alongside that, we have the rise, always present, but now off the scale of racist, ultra-nationalist, neo-Nazi, anti-Semitic, anti-migrant and Islamophobic forces in football crowds, many of which are practically connected to the actual political organisations of the far right, from Italy to Russia, from Hungary to Poland. So to conclude, these two extremes of European football the very best of the continent, the very worst of the continent. Is that something out of which an identity can be generated? It seems to me to be European in the 21st century is to acknowledge that with along with everybody else on this little piece of land, we live at the intersection of these extraordinary crises and forces. Economic transformation, technological transformation, the anti-migrant backlash and populist backlash of the last decade. But being European is to accept that we deal with this with a combination of conflict and cooperation, one that recognises the unity and the diversity of the continent. Football, it seems to me, and I think we're lucky in this, if read in this fashion, offers the material, the images, the stories, the notions, the moments, out of which we might fashion a plural, complex, and multi-layered form of European identity, which given how this continent actually works, is really just as well. Yes, thank, thank you so much, David Goldblatt, for this introductory speech. If I'm right, you're going to be hearing us right now also. Yes, yeah. there you are. Yeah. Thank you so much for this, for this speech. Um, maybe one more question before we also add Simon Cooper to the conversation. You, you, you gave an eloquent speech where you say that Europe is at the intersection of these crises, but you also mentioned the word political colonization. And we are actually in a kind of strange talk today because normally when you talk about football, you don't talk about the relationship between football and culture. You talk about the last match and who scored a goal. Why do you think it's important to have this talk? What's at stake if we talk about political colonization? I just think we live in a moment in which political power has shown more interest and taken more control over football institutions than it ever has done before. I mean, it's not you. You know, the 1934 World Cup, Cup was Mussolini's. The 1978 World Cup was the Argentinian Hunters. But we are living at a moment where uh, political parties and people with political agendas are buying football clubs, uh, making themselves president of football associations, uh, taking control of TV rights and building football empires. Um, and I think that's a problem. I don't think nation states and sovereign funds should own football clubs. Mm. Um, I don't think political parties should own football clubs. And I don't think football associations should be instruments for political fun. And that's always been going on for, it's been going on for some time, but I think we've reached a point where we actually just need to draw a line in the sand, no more. Yeah, and when you say we, 
we draw a line in the sand, you mean that the people that are watching football, that, that are enjoying it, should take this into account when watching it? Uh, who is the we? The eternal problem of all radical transformatory politics. I mean, the we is coalition yet to be built. There are plenty of people in football, both as individuals and as collectives, who are perturbed by the nature of governance in football and the pattern of ownership. Much of it, of course, is concentrated at the level, level of individual clubs. Yeah. Um, but out of that, you know, we need uh, a network of protest uh, and resistance to this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe that's a good moment to also add Simon Cooper to the conversation. Um, I think Simon Cooper is also... Here I am. Yes, very good. Just to shortly introduce you, you're the author of many amazing books, um, such as Football Against... The Enemy, Soccernomics, but also a book I enjoyed thoroughly about Ajax, the war and the Dutch. And your work, I'd say, deals with this intersections of football and society. What thoughts stood out for you while listening to David's speech? I think one thing I'd like to ask David about is the tension in football between the nationalist and the internationalist. And you see it at World Cups. You see it in any kind of international setting. So at a World Cup, people paint the country's flag on their faces. It's the biggest communal event. You know, if, if the Netherlands, I think Holland, Uruguay in uh, 2010 had 12 million viewers. So 75% of the Dutch population is watching. That's the biggest communal event the Netherlands has had uh, suddenly since World War II. Similar figures for France or Germany for big games. So these are very nationalist moments. But of course, the World Cup is also, you know, we enjoy the other countries. Um, there's a lot of kind of joking back and forth. There's a lot of fun had together. So how nationalist is international football and how internationalist is it? I, I think that's that tension keeps coming back. And I'd love to hear David on that. David? I'm really I'm so sorry, Simon. Uh, but I, I know you want me to talk about attention, but I couldn't hear enough of what you were saying um, <laughs> to work out what the tension was. I wonder if you could repeat it for me in a sentence and I'll see if I can come back to you. Is the World Cup a festival of nationalism or is it an international festival, you know, a la mention Yeah. Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, I think it's both, isn't it? I mean, you know, there's clearly a lot of there's clearly a lot of just straight old-fashioned nationalism going on, and you know, sometimes that takes a pretty unpleasant, nativist, aggressive turn. Um, sometimes it takes a very much more sort of carnival, plural form. So I think, you know, of course, there's all sorts of nationalism going on, and not just at the World Cup itself, but you know, back in the home nations, which is in a way where most of the World Cup is happening. But I think there is also, alongside that, flashes of something else, something a bit more sort of utopian um, uh, and something that resists, you know, the sort of crude logic of nationalism, you know, the possibility of cosmopolitanism, of kind of wider shared identities. I mean, I think about the way, you know, I, you may have mentioned this because I heard you talking about the 2010 World Cup. So forgive me if I uh, repeat what you said, but I think about the way... Africa embraced Ghana as its team at the World Cup in uh, in 2010 in a sort of truly sort of pan-African fashion. So I do think there is a bit of, there's both mm. going on. Yeah. Maybe, Simon, to uh, ask to you, if, if I ask you the same question, because you've um, said something about this tension you see, you can also say maybe that football... Uh, works on regional identities. If you talk about Barcelona, you know, the Catalan struggle. If you talk about people who support Ajax and would say they support Amsterdam. Um, how do you look at what's at stake if we talk about these questions? What identity arises from football? I think football is a very kind of peaceful way for people to assert their identities nowadays. So you can support Germany and it shows your kind of pride and happiness in being German, but you also, um, you know it's only a game. Everybody really understands it's only a game. Almost nobody is still upset the next morning or two days later. Very largely, we agree the rules. Um, we accept that the country that wins the World Cup has genuinely won it. 
And you have at the actual tournament, people from all countries, and David cited Euro 2004 as an example, but really it now happens at every tournament. Mm -hmm. Everybody's there, everybody's in the bars, people drink, people have a great time. The amounts of violence in football, there's a huge amount of media attention whenever there is any actual violence. But it's astonishing how little there is in that football brings together tens of thousands of mostly young men from these different countries at the games. And the atmosphere is very carnivalesque. So I think that almost always football is a kind of very uh, positive way for everybody to affirm their city, their regional, their national identities in kind of harmony with each other. So, you know, you can be German and he can be French. Yeah. And nowadays that's absolutely fine. Yeah, yeah. At, at the same time, um, David mentioned in his speech the political forces trying to gain a grip. I can imagine that they also try to maybe strengthen these kind of identities into becoming more than just football. Yeah, but I don't think that uh, I was watching what Putin was doing. I was at the Russian World Cup. And of course, the World Cup is a very, you know, he made a huge point about that. But the, the claim that Putin was making was not really Russia is the greatest country in the world. Our team is going to win this World Cup because they didn't have a good enough team anyway to have mm. that kind of Mussolini-esque platform. Really, the claim was, you know, we Russians have a good time. Everybody's quite happy. This is quite a jolly moment. The rest of the world uh, is here and is enjoying being in Russia. So really, Putin is sharing in that carnivalesque feeling for his own purposes. Yeah. So you tend not to get these kind of Mussolini-style assertions of national superiority through football anymore used by these dictators. It's much more kind of uh, for harmlosing, or, or trying to turn themselves into cuddly figures, I would argue. So football makes them look softer and more appealing. Yeah, football makes them look more human. I mean, Orban also always used it that way. I mean, he, he was a good footballer and he yeah, 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 yeah. used the image of himself as a footballer to yeah. um, make himself more human. David, that's maybe a good bridge to you because you actually wrote a piece about Orban. You visited him. We see a picture of you with him right now. You, you visited him um, to write a piece because you thought if you read history, if you read football, then what Orban is doing in Hungary is quite interesting. Sorry, I'm really so sorry, but the quality of the audio is very poor. I just can't hear you. Okay, maybe I can repeat it one more time. Um, you visited Orban and we were talking about how maybe football is being used for identity. Can you hear it now or not? Yeah, okay. How does football produce, how does football produce identity? Is that the question? Yes, with regard to Orban, because I thought it was a nice example. Well, with Orban. I mean, I just sort of want to add to what Simon was saying, which I could catch at one point really clearly, <laughs> is that football is particularly good for generating identities because... There are fewer and fewer occasions in atomized liberal societies in which we gather in large numbers and we gather in a relatively sort of public manner with quite a kind of mixture. And I think it's really telling that, you know, certainly in Britain, less than one in 10 people goes to football by themselves. Football is an intensely collective and simultaneously intensely ritual experience. Yeah. And in a, um, you know, essentially secular European continent, um, it, um, it provides a space, you know, for, for ritual and collectivity, which is the basis of a lot of identity yeah. formation. I mean, with regard to Orban, well, you know, I mean, at one level, I mean, he is just a bit bonkers. The man is completely obsessed. There is a kind of level of, you know, personal kind of project here of course it's a political project but i mean he is slightly it is his toy and it, you know his stadium allows him to be the king of the castle um but it's you know an effort to try and rewrite contemporary hungarian history and hungarian identity you know make hungarian football great yeah, again yeah, yeah, yeah. is what he said to me so it doesn't take much to work out where that's coming from and this profound sense that you know Hungary in the first half of the 20th century was a serious power and a serious place in Europe and really, really serious football power on top of that. And then, you know, after Triano, you know, after the first
First World War, it stripped of what was considered to be most of its population and land. And it's been languishing in mediocrity ever since. And I think that's the feeling, you know, about the football mm. since the magical Machiavels of the 1950s. So yeah. this sort of, you know, triumphalist, revivalist, expansionist version of a super proud Hungary, you can see how football um, is going to be the place that Orban's going to go to try and work those narratives yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's working on pride also then. L Laura, you, you were listening and, and before and you said you watched the speed and you got your thinking hat on. Yeah, I think one of the things that really struck me from your um, talk was around the, the finances and you, you look at the, the corruption in the game. Who do you think has the responsibility to do the reforms? Is it from the state? Because football, we were talking about football and the state being inter intermingled. Is it the football associations? Is it the governing bodies? If we are going to reform, how, how would you do it? And uh, who bears the responsibility? Well, that's a big question. Um, I think, uh, but a very good and very pertinent and very difficult question. I mean, I think on the one hand, you know, governments, uh, judicial authorities and police authorities have um, a whole raft of stuff that they could do to be dealing with corruption in general, of which, you know, the corruption in football and indeed in sport uh, in general is just one dimension. So, you know, the way in which money laundering works, you know, access to data, um, sort of, you know, the way companies are registered, the use of offshore, etc. There's a huge amount of stuff to be done, you know, uh, by every nation and by every regional authority on that, which would make a difference when it comes to football. Um, when it comes to, um, you know, like within football itself, whew, you know, where does one start? I mean, you know, on the one hand, it would be great if, you know, FIFA was an institution that could actually from above apply pressure and standards of high governance onto the football associations of the world because they've got a really big stick. You know, they could be saying to football associations, you know, if you don't shape up people, you know, then you can't play in the World Cup, you can't play international football. And suddenly everybody's, you know, everybody's finances are in trouble then. So that has potency. But of course, until they seriously, seriously put their house in order, it's very difficult for them, you know, to consider consider doing so. I mean, I'd also like to see, you know, it's got to be pressure from below too. Football associations have got to sort themselves out. Um, and, um, you know, I'd like to see, you know, as much as possible, the press, you know, um, you know, having, you know, doing more work on this. Um, but it's tough, it's expensive, and it's difficult work. Yeah. Um, but it's going to have to be a mixture of all of those things. Maybe Simon Cooper, in the speech of David Goldblatt, he talked about the um, football being the best maybe of Europe and also sometimes showing the worst of Europe. You are actually right now writing a book about maybe uh, the, the, the most prolific club in, in, in Europe, FC Barcelona. I, th I think you're actually in Barcelona now, right now, from a hotel room, working on that. If you look at the case of Barcelona, I think a lot of the things we are talking about comes together then. If we talk about financing, if we talk about um, image, if we talk about identity. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, I mean, I'd say two things. One is that I used to think that writing about football, football was a kind of lower activity than politics. And I nowadays write a political problem. And having for years written about Trump and Brexit and COVID-19 and climate change and all the terrible things that are happening, and now I turn to Barcelona and I'm telling the story of Johan Cruyff and Messi, I feel that football is about the highest activity in Europe. It's uh, a very rare source of beauty and also of comedy, harmony. Uh, almost everyone in the world loves watching Messi play and he, he's given people so much pleasure a friend of mine who has mental health problems says that Messi helps keep him keep him going. Mm. So I've, I've over the last few terrible years in politics, I've come to reevaluate football and appreciate much more what it gives us all. And the other thing, I mean, you ask about Barcelona is, as a Catalan symbol. Barcelona has huge financial problems now. They have no money at all. And I think one of the things that you see with FC Barcelona very strongly is the tension between a local, being a local club, which it very much is, it's run by local people. Uh, the players, it's, it's unusually local in its players. Uh, the members are 92% from Catalonia, but it is a global club now. And Chinese <coughs> people don't know what Catalonia is and don't care about that. 
And if you are going to pay Messi 100 million euros a year, you have to make a lot of money in China and the US. Yeah. And so you become a kind of Disneyfied version of yourself. You become a shirt selling operation and you lose the uniqueness of what Barca has historically been. Mm. And I don't really blame them for that. That's just what you need to do to, you know, to hire good footballers. Good footballers cost money. So that, I mean, there's this kind of corporate slogan, global, you know, we're global and we're local and it works. Mm -hmm. Actually, they're often in complete uh, contrast with each other. You can't always be global and local. And with Barcelona, I see them splitting on that issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe to conclude this small round and then we go to Aniola Aluko. Um, if we listen to David's speech, he says, if you want to understand society, history of, uh, or football can be a way to read it. So the problems in society can be read through looking at football. Would you say, maybe it's a too big question for a last question, but still, would you say that football is maybe, <laughs> while we listen to David sitting down again, um, <laughs> welcome back. Um, would you say that football is one step ahead of societal developments or maybe walking behind societal developments if we want to understand what's going on? Uh, mm. I, yeah, sorry, go on, David. You, you take this. No, 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 you go ahead, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I think the football activism this May around Black Lives Matter was the most strongest I've seen footballers take action. Uh, Raheem Sterling in England is a good example. Um, various players in the Bundesliga, like Marcus Thuram taking a knee. Uh, Marcus Rashford campaigning very successfully to get the government to keep giving free school meals to British school children. I've never seen this in 30, yeah, 40 yeah. years of writing about football. And I think that it's partly just simply because these footballers are much more than we realize. They are part of society. They grew up in society. They um, follow the debates of society and they're better educated than previous generation of footballers, which again is a social change. Yeah. And so now they are, they are very happy to take the microphone and speak about political issues without waiting for the club to give them permission. And so these footballers are members of Generation Z or are young millennials. And I think it's a mistake to regard them as in some way detached from society. They're not. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'd like to go to someone who's actually working now in the football industry. She's one of England's best ever players and has played more than 100 games for the national team. She's an author who just published her biography, They Don't Teach This. She's pundit for the BBC and licensed lawyer. And right now she's sporting director at Aston Villa's women's team. But before we talk to her, let's get some football in this venue. And we have a really short reel of goals of Eniola Aluko. Let's watch at it. Arriving, Aluko's there as well. G leaves it. Aluko! Lovely goal. Really well all night. The movement's good. She's worked well with the ball. Oh, there's she in here behind. The ball drops nicely for Aluko. And that is one goal back for Chelsea. G finally England once again. And here is Aluko. And Chelsea have the lead. Luco looks to go all the way herself. It's a powerful run and it's an outstanding goal. And Luca to drive towards goal. Eddie Aluka scores! Yes, Eniola Aluko, we, we could have had so much more goals and I don't think these are your most beautiful goals, but it's a good teaser for people to look on YouTube because there's so much more to find. I've had a really amazing hour watching all the goals, actually. <laughs> um, we're honored to welcome you. Thanks so much. How, how do you listen to this conversation? Because we're talking on a bit theoretical level about football and society. Does it seem distant from your everyday life in the world of sports? Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, thank you for sharing my goals. I, I still get nostalgic when I, I hear about and see, see my goals. Um, yeah, I think, I think in my current role at Aston Villa as director of football, The role is, uh, is a 360 role. It's not just about on the pitch and building a team that's successful on the pitch. It's about building a brand. It's about the purpose of the club underneath, um, you know, the football and what, you know, Aston Villa women represents um, to not just locally, but, but hopefully globally. So, um, you know, touching on the conversation about how, you know, Europe 
how connected we are in Europe through football. I think essentially what I'm trying to do is try and actually have a, a quite a smart approach to recruitment so that if we're recruiting a player, for example, from Denmark or Germany or another place in the world, we're doing that in order to connect with that fan base in that country. Yeah. So, you know, what social media has done is really made the world a lot smaller and much more connected. And actually just by having a Ghanaian player or a Danish player, a German player, that attracts a lot of attention from that country, particularly if the player plays for the national team. So that builds the fan base almost accidentally, almost kind of without you having to, to sort of go and do an event there or whatever. So player representation on an international level is very, very important. You have to be quite strategic about that. You know, we have a, you know, Aston Villa has a fan base in Germany. We have a fan base in North America. So that means that informs me in terms of my recruitment and being able to build a fan base, which is really important in women's football, to be able to say, well, why don't we, you know, why don't we recruit a German player? We, we, we have four German players in our squad. And, and, and that, was, that was a strategic decision. Yes, obviously they're great footballers, but it was a strategic decision to engage women in Germany, to engage mm. men in Germany, because you have, you know, you have German players that are representing their country for Aston Villa. So that's how kind of practically it can work in football in connecting countries with a club. But that's also, I think, um, you say it is, it's, it's strategic, it's also practical, but is there also an, a, a sort of intrinsic motivation that you want your squad to be representative, all the people who are watching yes. from different countries? Yes, of course. I mean, the best team I played for, I played for Chelsea for six years, and um, it was a wholly international team. You know, I was an English player. We had, you know, a good foundation of English players, but essentially we didn't go to the next level mm. until we started recruiting some of the best players from around the world. You know, my one of my favorite players of all time that I've ever played with was Jisoo Young. She played for South Korea. Couldn't speak a word of English when she arrived at the club, but remains one of the best players and, and you know, gave me a lot of goals. Yeah, yeah. So it's really important, I think, to be, you know, I, I heard, um, I think it was David talking about, you know, Barcelona being this sort of provincial club, but also being a global club. Aston Villa is very much a, a provincial club in terms of its, um, its affinity to Birmingham, where I grew up, that's my hometown. Um, but then the next stage is being able to kind of connect globally with pockets of, of, mm. of countries globally where there's a fan base. Um, and you cannot, it would be hypocritical to be able to do that if, you, if your actual product, yeah, if your yeah, team yeah. doesn't represent an international team. Yeah. Um, I think one of the problems that's kind of arising in with football is this kind of, this kind of xenophobic sentiment that, you know, we, you know, the idea that international players coming in is going to dwindle uh, English talent and it's not it's going to it's not going to help English talent to progress but it's actually it's actually false because i think if you look at women's football in the last five years the WSL has had an influx of international players and on on a parallel the England national team England women's national team have got two back to back world cup finals yeah, 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 yeah. and a, and a european final so actually bringing international players into a whole melting pot of nationalities only improves everybody. Yeah, but but, but improves actually improves everybody else's national team. But actually, you touch maybe also upon what we just ended with David and Simon. If we talk about relationship between society and football, the discussion whether or not uh, people from other countries take away English jobs is not only a, a football discussion; it's a societal discussion, and and. Mm. Um, David Goldblatt in his speech said something that football has been able to set up or is working on a serious anti-racism movement, for example. How do you yeah. look upon that if we look at what has happened in the recent months? Is football, because I think football teams are more diverse than in many other places uh, in society, is, is football a front runner also in that discussion, in trying to be actively anti-racist, for example? Yeah, I think I think football is a front runner in terms of bringing awareness to the problem. Um, I think football is a front runner in terms of being representative of what society should like look like on the field. You know, you know, the Premier League has I think forty percent black players playing on the field, but then when you look at off the field, 
when you look at sort of elite uh, leadership roles, when you look at coaching roles, it's embarrassingly bad. Hmm. So the question is, is that it's great for football to be a front runner in campaigns and, you know, uh, football activism. But actually underneath all of that, what's the substance? Because until you change some of these societal, um, these sort of racist societal expectations, i.e., you know, a black man can't lead a football team Mm. or, you know, a black woman in my case can't necessarily be a sporting director. Um, Really, it's just a surface... Um, it's a surface solution to a very yeah. deep problem. Yeah. We yeah. have to start getting to the root of this and saying it's all good and well having you know Black Lives Matter campaigns, kneeling, putting badges on shirts. But until the FA, until UEFA, until FIFA sit down and actually have some positive action towards why there is still a lack of black managers or, or ethnic minority managers around the world, why there is still, you know, boardrooms and people that control the money are almost exclusively white. For me, it's just, it's just, um, it's just a, a surface campaign that you yeah, know comes yeah. and goes. Yeah, it needs body. It needs structural change to be something yeah. that has some meat on the bone. Yeah, it needs, yeah. it needs structure. We we saw what what America did, the M- uh, NFL did in terms of. Um, you know, the Rooney rule and implementing, you know, policy changes in terms of, you know, representation, rep recruitment of coaches. Mm-hmm. And it had a big difference. Yeah, yeah. It had a massive difference in terms of what coaches look like. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then when the coach gets into that position, it's up to them to prove that they're good enough. But this idea that, you know, you just recycle the same people in sport and, um, you know, you don't give, the the rest of the world a chance to actually get those opportunities um i think that's the real root of the problem yeah yeah yeah. we actually have a great aston villa fan at the table is there something you 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 were wanting to ask (laughs) laura it's amazing yeah (laughs) i'm so glad that you're in charge because i'm expecting great things um i think one of the things that i'm really interested in is as a like the wsl is getting super strong we just poached a bunch of players some of the best players from around the world as a sporting director is it more prestigious for you to win the WSL or to win in Europe and how does that feel is it what yeah which one would you prefer or you can have both as well that's okay (laughs) (laughs) well I think for Aston Villa you know our objectives have have to be realistic Um, we've just got promoted um, and I think you've seen the influx of absolutely incredible players around the world coming into the English League and so the, the, the bridge between the championship and the WSL was already quite high. It's gone even higher this year. So I think staying in the league um, would be the primary objective and then building on that for the next two, three years. Um, of course, yes, getting into Europe is, is a, would be a huge achievement. Um, winning the league, I think, is something that, you know, probably would be a bit unrealistic in the next two, three years. But, you know, I think it's much easier to do it in women's football than it is to do in men's football. Yeah. Um, just because the competition level is a little bit different. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like I got very close to winning the Champions League with Chelsea, getting into the semi-final as a player. But unfortunately, you know, I, I, I retired before, you know, I could get that. But I think only 1% of players anyway win the Champions League. So that is the ultimate dream. Um, But I think actually Chelsea are probably the closest English team to doing that in the next two years. Their recruitment over the past year has been sensational with, you know, the likes of Sam Kerr and Pinilla Harder. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe before we add the rest of the panel again, do you think that if we talk about an identity erupting from football, um, I think the women's football is now, if you talk about an inclusive identity, you also want all the girls in Europe to feel represented on the pitch. Are you uh, hopeful about the direction female football is going? Or do you feel like there has to be some obstacles taken away before it's really as powerful, maybe, as also a cultural force as uh, male football? No, I'm, I'm super excited about where women's football is going. That's one of the reasons why I retired at the time I did and took this job, because I feel like there's a real forward momentum for the game. You know, there's lots of investment in the game from all, all sort of arms of the commercial world 
You're seeing broadcasting rights come into the game. You're seeing the WSL is now being watched in, you know, Australia with Optus, in America with NBC. Um, there's a there's a free to watch platform mm. app that you can watch all of the w, uh, WSL games. It's on BT Sport. It's on highlights. You know, growing up that didn't exist for me. Yeah. Um, there's that you know Barclays have invested you know millions into the league. Um, Vitality have just announced um, you know uh, uh, their their sponsorship. So the women's game is really going into a place that it's being valued on a global scale. Um, and now you're having leagues, leagues competitive. You know, you've got leagues in Sweden, in Italy, where I played, um, in but, America. But 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 um, how but how can you, since female football um, is growing, how can you make sure that you get all the pros that David Goldblatt has been describing in his speech about football, and at the same time try to steer away from the uh, commercial forces, the government forces, the inequality in male football. Um, h- how can we build a female football that maybe uh, serves a better example even? Well, I think it already does. I think the fact that women's football um, by by default inspires young girls to, to go and play football yeah. themselves. Grassroots participation has, has increased tenfold which means that the confidence of girls has increased. The ability to dream has increased. Um, stereotypes are being shattered. Yeah. Ba- you know, I, I do a lot of work with young girls from ethnic minority backgrounds whose parents tell them they shouldn't be playing because they're Muslim. But they're like, well, I'm playing, I'm talented. You know? So I think women's football, by, 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 the, by, the, by the very nature of how it has got to this point, there's been a lot of adversity that it's had to shake off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now it, now it, now it represents, um, you know, it, it's a progressive sport. It's a sport that really inspires young girls. Can we avoid the sort of corruption and, and, and you know, and, and those kind of ills that the men's game have? Probably more so, yes, because there's less, there's no, less money in the game. Mm. And there's a, puri- there's a purity to the game that I think, well, I hope that it can be protected through governance you know, the WSL, has, the FA has made sure that the WSL is a sustainable league. You can't just come in like some of the owners in the men's game and just plunge loads of money in. You have, you know, there's a sustainability, yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a salary cap, there's a licensing um, structure where you can't just say, right, okay, you know, I'm Manchester United, I, I want to have a women's team. You have to show how you're going to actually build that women's team over the next five so years. So you're optimistic so about that? I, very, very yeah, yeah, optimistic. Yeah. Very optimistic. Is is it perfect? No. It, 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 you know, th- there's no utopia in football, as I've just said. You know, there's still, you know, there's elements of, of racism. I think that that um, you know, are still in the women's game as they're in the men's game. Um, you know, there's there's now a situation where, because of the money that's coming into the game, you're seeing a lot of agents come in. You know, for girls younger age. Um, not yeah. necessarily being the right influence. You're seeing sort of a class shift. So I grew up on a council estate in Birmingham playing football. Now it's probably shifting towards more of a middle-class sport, yeah, yeah. which means that less ethnic minorities have access to it. So it's not perfect, um, but I think in terms of the global game, it represents a lot of good. Great. Let's expand the panel a bit more again and go to Simon Cooper and David Goldblatt. Um, maybe Simon Cooper, if I if I go to you, if we talk about um, these systemic things that run through society and also through football, the power of money, um, the the money streams that are directed everywhere, the way that maybe also identity is being formed not only by the club you play for but also the commercial forces around it. Do you see that football is right now at a point where we can continue in the same way or do you see that we're on a turning point and that just as in society people are saying maybe uh, banks should not only be interested in growth, that in football there's also a new mentality about how we should continue? I don't think so. I think most fans are fine with Qatar uh, United Arab Emirates owning football clubs with footballers, men earning 10 million euros with very dubious advertising for gambling companies on shirts. And the reason I say that most fans seem to be fine with it is they vote with their feet. 
And until COVID, the stadiums were full. Football has hardly ever been so popular. Mm -hmm. So many of us might not like these things and would wish it were different. But I don't see a mass movement of football fans rejecting this. Uh, football is corporate. Football is suffused in money from very dubious sources. And fans seem, the overwhelming majority of them, just fine with it. Yeah, but at the same time, we've said that football has such an amazing cultural value that it's like maybe the, 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 the strongest in, um, as an industry in, in saying something about who we are. But at the same time, we think the score is more important than what's happening. How, how do you move away from that? I actually don't think people no? care that much about the score. I think that people get from football a sense of community, an escape from loneliness, uh, a sense of beauty, yeah. uh, ritual. And so you see that, you know, any is at Aston Villa, the men's team have, have not been successful for very many years. But in Birmingham, it's still a very big club. And the people who are interested in them or who love Aston Villa are still there. They don't go away. In Holland, you see the same with Feyenoord. Feyenoord is not a successful club, but it's very much loved. So I actually don't think that fans are obsessed with, did we win yeah. on Saturday? They are much more engaged with, the club gives them identity and belonging. It's somewhere to go with your parents, with your children, with your friends. Yeah. It's a place where you don't have to speak to the people you love. You can just be there together. And whether you win or lose, I think most fans are not that worried about that. Of course, if you lose every week and you keep getting relegated, there's a problem. Yeah, but yeah. I don't think fans are obsessive about victory. But at the same time, if you talk about community, then it's also about the power of correction in community. At the same time, we've seen David say uh, there's a lot of homophobia, there is um, uh, racism. Is this community also self-correcting each other? Because I think we have... We Sorry, I'll just, I'll just quickly say something. I think we have grown. I mean, if I think of the issues that football has faced in my life, there was hooliganism, very much eradicated. Racism in stadiums, much, much less, certainly in, in Britain, than in the 80s when it was horrendous and omnipresent. There are countries like Italy and in Eastern Europe which still have that problem. Football has made progress. I completely agree with Annie that the next battle that needs to be fought is about black players or non-players getting roles as coaches and in boardrooms. And I find it amazing that football has neglected that completely and has taken almost no steps at all to change that. But I do see football as a more humane activity than it was when I first started getting interested in the 70s, when women's football had just been unbanned, remember? And women it was excluded to the point that in England, women were not allowed to play in the Football Association until 1971. Yeah, yeah. I think we lost David Goldblatt along the way, by the way. I, no, I hope I'm he... still here. Oh, you're I'm still... just got my video <laughs> off. I'm just in. Sorry, I... Can I just pick up on that point yes. on homophobia? Please, Aniola, and then, and then we can see if we can see David again. So please continue, Aniola. No, I was just going to pick up on that point about, you, about homophobia and, and women's football really being an example, I think, um, to that issue. Uh, you know, there's a lot of sort of openly gay uh, players in the women's game um, who sort of really represent a, a boldness towards sexuality in, in sport that um, is lacking in the men's game. Mm. Um, and there is sort of a, a respect and an openness in the women's game that I think to sexuality that I think is, is, is reflective of society. I think, um, you know, in this day and age now, it's less of a problem if you are gay. Um, Whereas I think in men's football, there's still an issue there. You know, any player that is gay um, may feel they they don't want to say that because they'll be abused on the terraces. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot that, you know, the men's game can actually take from the women's game in that area. Um, and I actually think that, you know, if a male player does come out as gay um, and plays for a Premier League club, they will be highly respected and highly um, praised um, because I think when you talk to male players, they're not they're not bothered. That it's not you know it's not something that they would feel fearful of. But I think the but fear is it the problem more the, the backlash family. on on social media and Twitter so that we need to find yes. a way for people to stand yes. around them? Yes, but but I think the reality is, as a professional footballer, you're going to get backlash regardless. Yeah. 
yeah. You know, whether you score a goal, whether you don't score a goal, whether you're black, you're white, you're a woman, you're a man, social you're media is a toxic eye. place. Yeah. So it's not going to get any worse because somebody's gay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's easier for me. It's easy for me to say, you know, but I think, I think this kind of fear around social media abuse, I mm. think is, is, um, you know, it's not something that should stop anybody being themselves yeah. because ultimately that's part, that's, it's part of the course now, yeah. I think until, that- until the likes of Twitter and, um, are actually going to stop the abuse being able to be done so freely. Yeah. We have to just see it as part of, you know, part of the game that we play. Yeah. David, m- maybe to go to you, if we look at the future of football and it's linked to identity in European culture, what do you think is going to be the key aspect of it in, in, in the coming years? Because you said you can read history through football. How can we in 30 years read history from the coming years? That's a bit speculative. Huh? Yeah, sorry about that. No problem. Um, Well, one thought that occurs to me is a question I ask a class of students in California every time I teach a uh, introduction to uh, football classes. You know, who's your club? How did you acquire it? And, you know, usually there would be tales of, you know, fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters and dragged off to, you know, games and whatever. And I find increasingly over the last 10 years that now up to one third of the class, they they started supporting a team because they played them on FIFA, the video game. And um, I think that's a really, there's an interesting dilemma and question um, for the future, Um, whether the digital version um, rather than the physical analog playing version comes to dominate people's formative experiences and expectations um, of what they want. And secondly, I increasingly find, and it is cliche, forgive me, but I find many folks of, uh, of that generation are struggling with 90 minutes and they really prefer everything zipped down to the highlights. Um, and they struggle, you know, um, with boredom and mediocrity, um, which I think is sort of part of you've got, to put, you've got to put your time in with some of that to appreciate the very best of it. So I wonder how attention spans and the digitization of the game will affect um, the game more more widely. Yeah. The other question I would uh, I would pose is, you know, football's played outdoors. You know, I mean, yeah, sure, we do play indoor football. Football's an outdoor game. And so it's very dependent on the weather. And the weather is changing really fast and not in a very good way. Um, and I do wonder, what what is the fate of, you know, grassroots football in Ghana? or Benin in 2050, when there are regularly weeks and weeks that will be above 40 or 45 degrees centigrade. Um, And that opens up a whole big stuff about the relationship between football and global sport and and climate change and carbon emissions. But I think that's going to be a very, very big issue in the next 30 years. But what could possibly replace then? Um, No. Oh. Let me rephrase it. What would, um, um, if <laughs> the digitization um, makes it uh, different, the sense of belonging, because people on FIFA check what their club is going to be instead of where they were born or how they were raised or what their parents did. If um, the, the weather conditions change to the fact that it's more difficult to play outside and if the attention span decreases <laughs> to such a pace that football in the contemporary form is not really attractive anymore, then what would a new industry or a new sports need to have the same effect on that identity we are talking about tonight, to have that same appeal and force? Oh, I don't think there is anything else on the horizon just at the moment. I mean, that's why it's such a kind of extraordinary, valuable set of cultural treasures, the whole of football and what it offers and why they need protection and why um, we can't abandon them to purely economic and political forces, however short term many of us feel about their impact. Because this is, you know, this is something we've inherited from the last 150, 160 years of modern global history and of European history. And something, you know, that if you're going to pass it on to the next generations, then you have to do something about it. So what should we do, Aniola? 
to maybe kick out the economic forces right now? I mean, as a sporting director, you're also in the industry of having to compete with prizes, etc. But 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 how how can we move away from that? Well, I'm not sure about kicking out economic forces. <laughs> I need economic forces. Um, I think uh, the investment of, of uh, you know, a lot of these huge men's teams into women's teams is very important, provided it's sustainable, provided it's, um, there's a, there's a long-term commitment there. Um, I think, in, you know, negative economic forces like, you know, corruption, uh, match fixing, um, betting, I think is slowly going out of the game. I know Aston Villa, the sponsor last year was, was a betting company this year. There was a, there was a strategic decision for it to be um, a non-betting company. So those are, you know, those are the sort of economic forces we want to keep away from, from the women's game because of its purity, because it's more of a family-based, um, you know, has more mm. of a family-based audience. But I think actually we want to encourage more investment. Yeah, 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 we yeah. want to encourage more commercial investment. We want to encourage more players being, you know, getting sponsorship deals from the Nikes and the Adidas and the Pumas, we, you know, to create an action economy for women's football that is, you know, that starts to make money in the next 20 years versus being this sort of parent and child, you know, structural yeah, economic yeah. relationship. Yeah. We want to be able to have investment so that we can start to build a fan base who then, you know, pay into the product. And um, at the moment, women's football is still kind of seen as a, a great product, but it's free. Yeah. It's cheap. You know, we want we want it to be you need something value. that in, in yeah, in ten years time, fans are paying fifty pounds to watch, you know, Aston Villa versus Chelsea at, at a women's specific stadium. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Maybe Laura. So I would, I would definitely encourage economic force, yeah. positive economic force. <laughs> point made, point made. Laura, if you listen to this and, 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 and playing soccer on, on Tuesdays at footy at uh, Slaughter Park. Yeah, very um, committed amateur. Very committed amateur. What's your take on, on if we look at the, the positive forces, the negative forces and identity in that and how that should I think it's, in the, in the, in it's really years. interesting listening, especially to the, the pay, because if you really stop and think about some the inequalities in salaries, in the you were talking any about the the, the gulf in investment in the different um, clubs. And actually, will we reach a point where there's a ceiling? If you stop and think about how much a professional top level footballer earns like per minute, we like most of us in this room, I don't know what you do, but I'm assuming that most of you will never see that kind of money in your lifetime. And is that something that then um, separates the um, amateur on the football pitch who turns up every week for the pure joy of kicking the ball around from this, what it is essentially a business? And does that, is that taking the joy out of the game? Should we stop it? Should we keep it? Is it fair value for what we're, we're getting from this, these amazing players, the, the entertainment. Yeah. So in some ways you have this, I see it as a bit of a negative that it, when you move people so far beyond this inequality, it, it's not real, it's a fantasy world. But at the same time, you've got all these other beautiful things that bind us together. You've got social change through the Women's League bringing economic empowerment. You've got, um, as Simon was saying, Barcelona and this, incredible club that brings people together so um i guess as david concluded you have the the best of europe and you yeah. have the worst of europe all bundled together in one game but but simon if you if you look at this business element and i think you describe it quite well it's 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 a matter of choice maybe if you want to strengthen the best of it or the worst of it but at the same time maybe the word we haven't mentioned yet is accountability i mean um, football is a place where money, power and identity, as David says it, come together, where they work together. But the power we have in democratic governments, we can hold them accountable to a certain extent. But if we talk about these grave issues, such as, we haven't even talked about that, human trafficking of young uh, African footballers, if we talk about the corruption, the bribery, the financial situation, how can we, for example, take steps to also hold these big business accountable? I think you have to think what is a football club and a football club exists to serve its community. It's not, a football club is not like Shell. A football club is like a museum. 
in that it's a community asset that is doesn't have to make a profit. It shouldn't lose money, but it should just, um, you know, not make a profit and make the local people happy. And the way to ensure that, I think, is the Barcelona or Athletic Bilbao model that is owned by members. And it's very regressible that in England they don't have that, that football clubs since the 19th century have been limited companies. And then in the last 20 years have been bought by very rich foreigners who often made their money in very dubious ways. So I would like to see a pan-European push towards membership democracy which is a model we know. It's a model we also know in Portugal. We know it works. And I think that must be the next step for football. And that would ensure that, make it less likely that your club does things that you're ashamed of. Yeah, yeah. David, good idea? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, no, of course. I mean, you know, forms of, of uh, collective ownership seem to me just absolutely essential in football and of course we have it in germany you know we have a model where 51 percent uh, of clubs have to be owned um by the original amateur club um and there are elections for um the, uh, the presidency and the board yeah i think it is i mean i would actually like to go as far as seeing uh, a certain amount of a turnover tax in the big leagues being used to buy back clubs for their fans i mean i actually think you know we can't how else are these ever is Manchester City ever going to be returned from the clutches of, uh, of a Gulf Emirate? Um, so I would actually like to see some of the money in football used over the next 20 years to steadily buy back shares of these institutions and place them in collective ownership. Is that, a, is that utopian or is that really something that you think would be feasible? Well, I don't see why not. I mean, it's not rocket science. The, Swede, the Swedes were going to do this in the mid-1970s through the Meidner plan, where the shares of companies that workers, um, you know, worked for were going to be steadily transferred to the uh, pension funds mm. run by the trade union based companies, and the companies would go into social ownership. So I, I really just don't see why not. It's not very, di very difficult. And we're actually only talking, you know, in the scheme of the global economy as a whole, Uh, about you know a few billion a few billion quid and football's yeah. generating like insane amounts of money. So let's just take two three percent off the top and just use that to pay back these dudes. And you know, so let's actually, get them out. Let's get the money lenders out the temple. So actually, you're, you're saying not to make Hungarian football great again, but take football back again. That's actually how you would phrase it. <laughs> Yes, okay. Yeah, I take yes, that as a yes. Yes, Hungarian football, Let's not dive into that too deep. We're, we're going to top off this uh, online program and then take some questions from the audience. Um, maybe, uh, Laura, to, to, to top the online program off with you, at the end, um, you are in the habit of kicking world records. What's the next world record going to be? Is it also going to be in football? Well, it would be great. I think... One of the things that we've got our eye on is that England is hosting what is now Euro 2022. Um, and there's a lot of excitement around the women's game and a lot of clubs getting behind it. So it'd be great to do a world record there. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to thank our panel very much. Uh, stay tuned for the questions from the audience. I want to thank Laura Youngson. Um, and I want to thank you so much for watching online and for tuning in. Uh, please have a look at our YouTube channel where all the programs are going to be or already are of the Forum on European Culture or for the other programs that are starting any minute now. Uh, and thank you so much for watching. Give the panel a warm hand of applause. Yeah.